Hey guys, welcome back to another week of Meggie's case study videos. Today we have an interesting case from Akash. Yeah, so this was a lady from my uh, ortho job. Um, this is not orthopedic related whatsoever. So this is a 53 year old lady, past medical history of hypertension, hyperlipidemia, diabetes. Uh, she status post uh, total knee arthroplasty on the right side, uh, post op day two. And she started developing chest tightness and palpitations overnight. Um, so I went to go see this patient. She reported it for about a day, but didn't, she, she didn't say anything about it. She felt weird, I guess, um, complaining to the nurse or anybody else. So, so she, you know, of course she complains about it at 3 a.m. Um, and so I went to go see this patient, uh, had about palpitations for about 16 to 18 out 18 hours. She was saying first time she's ever had palpitations in her life. Um, uh, but no other symptoms whatsoever. So, um, she, you know, she denied the the usual stuff like fever, chills, headaches, visual disturbances, mm -hmm. any chest, typical chest pain, any shortness of breath, abdominal pain, uh, and bowel or bladder changes. Her dressing was clean, dry, and intact. Um, and she was doing otherwise pretty well. She was talking to me in no acute distress, conversing very pleasantly. Um, but yeah, so her past surgical history is... Obviously, the, the total knee that she had two days ago, past medical history, like we mentioned, was hypertension, hyperlipidemia, and diabetes. Uh, she has no allergies. Currently, she takes Losartan for blood pressure, simvastatin for the cholesterol, and then metformin for the diabetes. And you have her on all that on the floor? I'm sorry? And you have her on her antihypertensives? On the floor. On yep, on the floor. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, she has family history of diabetes and CAD. Her vitals were stable, so her heart rate was 90, her blood pressure was 130 over 80, and her temperature and other vitals were all stable. Okay. Okay. Uh, you know, I started examining this patient. Like I said, in general, she has no acute distress. She was conversing very pleasantly. Her chest, I heard an irregularly irregular rhythm, uh, and no other extra sounds in terms of lungs. She should cleared auscultation bilaterally no extra sounds and then her abdomen was soft and non-tender her dressing was clean dry and intact and extremities were warm and well perfused so all in all pretty good so when a patient comes you know with first time palpitations for about 12 to 18 hours and you hear irregularly irregular rhythm on your auscultation with cardiac exam what are you thinking I'm thinking she is developing a fib and needs an EKG. Yeah, yeah. Wait, why didn't you say a flutter though? Because it's irregular. Yeah, so the differentiation between a fib and a flutter a fib is going to be irregular rhythm, a flutter is going to be a regular rhythm. So you're right, we got an EKG. So the EKG showed irregularly irregular rhythm without any P waves. Classic atrial fibrillation, right? Thank okay. you. So what was our heart rate on the EKG? It it was fluctuating, but the average stayed in the mid to low seventies. On the on the actual monitor, it originally showed ninety. However, when we did the EKG, it was around mid to low seventies. So, what do you think, stable or not? Yeah, she's very yeah. stable. Stable AFib, yeah. Um, and so, in terms of treatment, what do you think we would do for a stable symptomatic patient? Nothing. Yeah. She's fine. She needs further workup, but at 3 o'clock in the morning, an AFib patient that's rate controlled is likely to spontaneously resolve back into a normal sinus rhythm. Yeah. yeah. Within a couple of days, not exactly. necessarily like exactly. right then and there, but. Exactly. Um, and obviously, continue to monitor. Right. Uh, yeah. Put her on telemetry so. if she wasn't already. Yeah. And then, you know, I continue, I, I continue to observe her, and overnight, she was back on to uh, normal sinus rhythm. Happy ending for her. Yeah. And, you know, obviously we have to send her to a cardiologist afterwards yeah. for outpatient management. Um, but let's get into atrial fibrillation. Um, so, you know, this is the most common arrhythmia, mo most common cardiac arrhythmia. This is characterized by an irregularly irregular rhythm like we talked about. And this causes basically quivering of the atria. Yeah. Uh, when that happens, you can't, fully uh, squeeze the atria, which means all the blood doesn't go to the ventricle. 
And when it just stays there and cools there, it's prone to uh, clot. So that stagnant blood, blood is giving you a high risk factor of a thrombus formation. And then eventually a thrombus formation can travel as an emboli anywhere in the body and cause a lot of trouble. Like, Strokes, heart attacks, bowel attacks. Yeah, exactly. Bowel oh. attacks. So we're calling mesenteric ischemia. <laughs> bowel attack. I like a bowel attack. Um, so yeah, you're right. So there's three types. There's paroxysmal, which is... Um, and exactly as it sounds. Yeah, atrial fibrillation, you know, that has a spontaneous uh, etiology and also resolves spontaneously with that within seven days. Like our lovely lady. Yeah, exactly. Her probably less, like, less than 24 hours. And then we have uh, persistent, which is uh, atrial fibrillation that does not resolve spontaneously and lasts more than seven days. And then there is long-standing persistent atrial fibrillation, which is persistent atrial fibrillation for more than 12 months. Okay. In terms of risk factors, you have hypertension and CAD. These are the most common ones. Our lady had high blood pressure and had family history of coronary artery disease. So she had those risk factors. And she has hypertension, hyperlipidemia, and diabetes. diabetes. She right. has the triad for right. developing it. Developing Any cardiac CAD. event, exactly. Yeah. Um, so, you know... She was unique because she had symptoms. 90% of these patients do not have any symptoms. They're completely asymptomatic. Uh, the 10% who do have symptoms, what do you think their symptoms are? Um, I generally see patients, palpitations, mm-hmm. um, some complaint of shortness of breath, yeah. you know, difficulty, just dyspnea. I also see some symptoms of symptomatic hypotension coming just because your ventricles aren't filling, so you're not ejecting. Um, so they get dizzy, yeah, lightheaded. Yep, and oh, just chest tightness. A lot of chest tightness. Chest tightness, exactly. She's like, Phew. yeah. So, so you got it. So palpitations, dyspnea, fatigue, um, chest tightness. These are some of the most common symptoms of atrial fibrillation. And on exam, you find what you would with this patient. So you know you'll have an irregularly irregular rhythm, which is characteristic of atrial fibrillation. Yeah. Um, and they typically tend to be for anywhere from 70 to 140. Typically, if they're... Heart rate, right? Yeah, heart rate of 70 to 140. Thanks for <laughs> clarifying It's not an that. age. Yep. <laughs> um, and then rarely over 150. Once you get over 150, that's when you start getting into atrial flutter. And that's going to be a regular rhythm, yeah. remember, so... Um, and much less common. Yeah. So for diagnosis, you want to get an EKG. That's the initial test. Also, the best test you can get for this. Um, what do you see on an EKG? An irregularly regular rhythm. If you yeah. take anything away from this video, I think, it's I an irregularly yeah, regular exactly. rhythm. Um, you also get a heart rate, which is a large part of your next steps. Yeah. So in terms of treatment for atrial fibrillation patients, you want to see if they're rate controlled, right? So in an asymptomatic patient who is who has atrial fibrillation, you want to have them under 110 beats per minute. Okay. If these patients are symptomatic, you want to rate control them under 85 beats per minute. But then again, you want to look at if this patient is stable or unstable. Mm -hmm. So you want to look at the rate, the ventricular rate for these patients, right? That's the big deciding factor of what you're going to do next. If your patient is symptomatic, you want their heart rate to be around 85. If your patient is asymptomatic, you want their heart rate to be around 110. Mm-hmm. They're holding their blood pressure and their heart rate starts to get higher than that, higher than 85 in symptomatic or higher than 110 in asymptomatic. You need to try to bring that down. So what's the best way to do that? Best way to bring... A heart rate down with a stable blood pressure. Beta blockers? Beta blockers. Chalcium channel, channel blockers. blockers. Yeah, we use libido and low pressure a lot, followed by DILT. Yep. What do you do? So low pressure and diltiazem. Yeah. Yeah. If that's so, that's a lot of antihypertensives, right? You can end up lowering someone's blood pressure too much. Mm-hmm. So, if they then develop hypotension along with their increased heart rate, then they're considered an unstable patient. Correct. So, you've exhausted your calcium channel blockers, right. your beta that's blockers. Exactly you can theoretically give them a bolus and try again, but an unstable AFib patient with hypotension, what would you do? So I try to give them fluids first um, and see if that can bump the blood pressure, mm-hmm. if that can uh, improve the heart rate too. Um, if that typically doesn't happen, uh, I think my next choice is usually amiodarone. Yeah. Um, 
giving them a bolus of amiodarone and see if that works. And eventually, yeah. So when I'm at that stage at 2.30 in the morning, yeah. I like to do an amio bolus and then put on an amiodarone drip mm-hmm. to kind of keep them controlled. Mm-hmm. Do you do the amio bolus to keep and continue with a drip or just an amio bolus? I just do an amio bolus. Okay. Yeah. Um, and that next step is usually call cardiologist. Call cardi- yeah, they'll, t- they'll pretty much tell you what's. <laughs> yeah, um, but you know, eventually, if these patients are not being converted into normal sinus yeah. rhythm, they're going to have to be cardioverted. Um, and so that's atrial fibrillation. But as a complication, you know, we also talked about thrombus formation. Um, so this is where anticoagulation comes in. Yeah, and um, the thrombus formation is what makes AFib dangerous. So dangerous. Yeah. Not so much that you're quivering, but... Right. That's exactly right. And so anticoagulation part plays, is going to play a huge role yes. in this, right? So um, we use the chads vas score, which is basically a scoring guideline uh, uh, for atrial fibrillation patients who are at risk factors for stroke. Um, basically, it's... So why don't you just go through it? Yeah. So CHF, hypertension, age over 75, diabetes, stroke vascular disease, age over 65 to 74, and sex, female. Um, so here, female will get one point. Um, in terms of two points, every, every, everything will get one point except for two things. It's going to be age over 75 and history of stroke. Those two will get two points. Everything else would get one point. In terms of scoring, if they score a zero, it's, they don't require any intercoagulation. If they score one, they don't require any anticoagulation by recent guidelines. Only if they score two or above is when they require anticoagulation. What's your drug of choice? Yeah, I was going to say, so So now the drug of choice by, by recent guidelines is factor 10A inhibitors. This is going to be your rivaroxaban, dabigatran, apixaban. And, um, you know, if those are too expensive, not covered by insurance... Um, patient preference you can choose warfarin but that's kind of going out of style now just because of continuous monitoring yeah.